can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm here with Dave Oates and Bill Burr. I'm going to introduce them formally in a second. Before I do, guys, I like to just mention a few other episodes people should check out. And um, I've had some amazing entrepreneurs, you know, the found, you know, co-founder of Pixar and Atari and P90X. But I love, uh, I've had some cool agency owners on. And so for that, I would check out the one I did with Ian Garlick and Duncan Elney and Jason Swank. Um, those were fantastic. And this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. We're an easy button for helping create podcasts for businesses. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that over the past over decade to profile the people and companies I admire on my podcast and allow give them a platform to say, talk about what they're doing. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. And if you have questions, you could email us at rise25.com. We've been doing it for, for a long time now. So check us out, support at rise25media.com. Today, I'm excited. We have Dave Oates. He's principal at PR Security Service, and he possesses more than 25 years of strategic public relations experience. He started as a U.S. Navy public affairs officer, he helps address a myriad of crises spanning from military, government, corporate, charity, and startup environments. And his crisis communications experience includes handling employee and executive misconduct, cybersecurity attacks, product recalls, mass layoffs, large-scale accidents, criminal investigations, and civil litigation matters. You probably they have a laundry list of amazing stories and we're going to talk about some. Some of them you can never tell, I'm sure, but but we'll we'll talk about a few on here, right? Sounds good. No, I've, uh, I'm not devoid of having good things to talk about over the coffee table. Yes. Um, and Bill Byrne is co-founder of Remedy Public Relations. He's got a 25-year career in public relations. He's worked on campaigns for brands such as Intel, Burton Snowboards. If, you could, if you're watching the video, you see some of the the boards behind him, uh, skateboards. He does snowboarding too. Uh, Sony, Procter and Gamble, as well as emerging brands in tech, healthcare, finance, even craft beer. Uh, and Bill, thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to start off with you know we're gonna we're gonna dig a little deeper. But how do you guys know each other? And I know you do slightly. You know, at, at the surface, people would go, "Oh, you both do PR, but you do very different things." So, Dave, so how I'll do you? you. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, sorry. I, I, it's it's the quintessential way that business always gets done. It's through networking, mutual contacts. We get referrals to each other. Um, and Bill and I have known each other for for some time because you're right. Different flavors of PR uh, allow us to be able to refer to business. I only do the crisis stuff. And Bill is a whiz and his team is a whiz at the promotional stuff. And so there's perfect synergies into being able to refer each other to opportunities with our own clients or with other people that, you know, we get introduced through through other means. And I think that's the way business should be done. I want to give a big shout out to Katie Wagner. Uh, She's a CEO of KWSM who introduced us. And that's the reason we're having this conversation. So thanks, Katie. Appreciate it. And Bill, what were you going to say? Oh, it's just that, you know, David's hovered around my radar forever. And one of my personal shortcomings is I'm not the best at networking. And eventually he just popped into my feed one more time. And I said, all right, I'm dropping this guy a line. Listen, we know <laughs> some of the same people, some of them even like me. Like, let's just, and this was, you know, unfortunately during the mask times, I'm like, let's jump on a Zoom call and like get to know each other better. And we don't, while we both do PR, we don't play in the same sector. So it, it's been truly mutual beneficial. And especially with, you know, I preach about what Dave does because. Dave is the kind of guy, you know, better to know me and not need me than need me and not know me Uh, when it comes to crisis PR, like, and he'll get into that later, but. I love to hear about staying disciplined. Okay. So like I hear people who are on the surface look alike, but they've kind of niched down to a specific either service or type of company. And Cause it's probably easy. I'm, I'm sure Dave, you get people saying, Hey, can you just do PR for me? And you have to, 
it takes some distance. Like, no, we don't do that. We only do this. And same thing with you, Bill. So I'd love to hear both your views on how do you stay disciplined? Cause it's probably enticing. Go ahead, Dave. It, it, it is, it is, um, it, it is such a art form to be able to believe in yourself to such a degree that when somebody is willing to pay you money to do something that isn't necessarily in your wheelhouse, or at least what your service model, you know, pretends, um, to give that away, right? And and I'll tell you, I so I, I've I've done promotional in the past. You mentioned, you know, I've got, you know, twenty five years in your various capacities, but I I had recognized that I have a unique, I think, a unique skill set, crisis PR, and decided to focus on that exclusively a handful of years ago. And at the time, right when you pivot, you don't necessarily generate the same amount of revenue. You've got to retool your network and get referrals, and it takes a little bit of effort. And for a few months, I was turning away business without having any <laughs> in the hopper. And, and that, that was painful and, and, and sweated. And, and I sweated a lot of that and cried a few tears when I did that. But I'll tell you, if you're good at what you do and you focus on yeah. a particular differentiator and, and you hone that as, as fine as you can, uh, eventually it's, it's very lucrative. And I mean, I you had a strategy for that. that. Yeah. I mean, you knew some, you knew in your heart of hearts, that was the best yeah. way. Why? Did you, I mean, it would have been easy to take those, especially in the times when you needed the client. So you, you mentioned my background as a Navy officer, and that's where I became attuned to crisis PR, because when you're active duty in, in forward operations, crisis is just part of what you deal with. And I had, I, I say the privilege, but I obviously don't mean this in, in, in that they were fun times, having the experience to be the public affairs officer for aircraft accidents, mishaps on boards that involved loss of limbs, and in some cases, loss of lives, um, uh, hot war environments, uh, sailors and Marines uh, not doing what they were supposed to do in ports of call, and things like that. And then when I went into the private sector about 20 years ago, I was the one who was in charge of mass layoffs and product recalls and CEO uh, misgivings and things like that. And so um, so when, when about five, four or five years ago, as these little mobile devices that we all have uh, carrying around in our pockets became the way in which people talk. And talked in not so nice terms about any organization that just, you know, irked them one morning because they had a bad dream. Uh, I decided there, there was an opportunity to be of service to far more organizations because any company of any size can go from hero to zero in an Instagram post. And, and so I, I said, I think this will help me differentiate myself and not compete with stellar people like Bill and other PR professionals who were doing an amazing job. And, and, and so I say, yeah, I wasn't going to compete with those great people. Let me go do something that I think I do really well. And that is something different. And, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, the leap of faith um, turned out really well, not through, not without its uh, share of heartaches in the process though. Yeah. And then, you know, so there's a differentiation piece, Bill, but what about you? How do you stay disciplined? Because I'm sure you get a lot of requests for various services and you could just as easily say yes as well. You're definitely right. Uh, and David has bumped into this and he alluded to this before. Being, you know, the managers of the companies, it's very hard to turn down that money, especially when you made like such a massive pivot like David did earlier. But part of it is it is a, it's a small industry and your business will grow by doing the best work possible and having the best case study. So if something is too outside of our lane, we won't touch it because. It'll, it'll take us more effort than the typical client, and we just won't deliver. Like there's certain zones and never say never, but for a great example, we do fashion. We do apparel, but we don't do high fashion. If you're a brand that goes to New York Fashion Week, we're not for you. So there's, it's knowing where you can play and, and where you can't, because also you want, at the end of the day, you want to be able to do a good job. You want to like your job. And if it's a struggle for the team, if this is something that's is so outside their wheelhouse that, you know, people are going to show up every day and hate coming to work, that's going to affect everything else we do. So, you know, you've got to look at it from what, what can we do well? What will we enjoy doing? And, you know, at the end, what's going to benefit our client? Because, you know, if you're a client of ours and we don't deliver, well, that referral is not going to come to the next guy. There's no case study. There's nothing to show. So it is. It's very difficult, but if you want longevity in this industry, like any other good industry, you know, you've got to be, mm. got to have that discipline. Yeah. Dave, uh, and, and, it be, 
you know, it becomes this death spiral too, right? The more you chase sort of the short-term dollars or what, you know, you hear the shiny ball, the less focused you are in having a repetitive, sustainable operational and revenue model. And so you wind up only achieving a certain level of success and usually with a great deal of blood, sweat and tears and heartaches in the process that over time is just hard to maintain. And so, I, you know, and, and, and mind you, right, I, I've, I've been on my own in a consultant capacity, you know, hung on my own shingle for 16 years. It took me really until the last five years to figure that out. And I've got the battle scars to prove it. So I'm not sitting here, you know, on this podcast telling folks, well, this is how, you know, I'm smart. And no, it's because I screwed it up for so freaking long that I finally decided I got to work smarter, not harder. I love it. I want to hear, you know, I said in the, in the bio, some examples, you guys have some probably really cool stories from your journey. And um, Dave, uh, there's one that is more current that's COVID related. So I love for you to talk about that. I appreciate the opportunity out of the what, 25 plus years. I mean, I do want to hear like, you know, when you talk about the Navy, you, you probably have some crazy stories of people, like you said, losing limbs. And, and I don't even know how you go back and tell people that that's happening, but we'll start with COVID first. Um, I, I, I can go into that from there. There's a couple of stories in my Navy days that come immediately to mind, but this one occurred at the beginning of January. So there's a doctor in Houston. Um, his name is Hassan Gokul, uh, as, as, as the public can see when you Google the guy's name a lauded emergency room physician for 20 years who got hired by the county public health department to help with COVID mitigations and to roll out the vaccine initiatives when the vaccines became available. First one that he was in charge of, which is the first one ever for the county at the end of December for healthcare workers and first responders, they, without a lot of process and protocols, got sent the vaccine. He goes out, uh, inoculates as many healthcare workers and first responders that came out. After working 12 hours on this with his team, about seven o'clock at night, about 15 minutes prior to that, one healthcare worker ro- rolls up and they were injecting him with the Moderna vaccine. They had to open a new vial for that. And each vial contains about 11 doses. So after doing so, now he's got an open vial with 10 doses left. And folks may not know, when you puncture a vial of vaccine, the time clock starts and you've got six hours before those vaccines expire. You've got to get those in the arms of people. Now, what the county basically told them to do is stick it back in a box, send it back to the office, and we'll deal with it in the morning. Well, the morning was too late. Those were going to be useless. And this is the end of December. ICU beds were full. Ambulances were parked outside the hospitals, running with people in the back, waiting for an ICU bed to open. He called his operations counterpart, says, I'm going to find qualified people, 65 and older, comorbidities to inject these 10 dosage and and use them up there. And long story short, he spent the next six hours of his own time, in some cases, driving to people's homes to do that, filled out all the proper paperwork the next morning, felt pretty good going above and beyond as a public servant. And he was rewarded for that eight days later by the county public health by being fired for what they call theft. And two weeks later was charged Mm -hmm. by the district attorney for theft. I got called in um, through a mutual contact and me and the criminal defense attorney, a guy by the name of Paul Doyle, righted that wrong, be able to set the reset the narrative that went global. He was they publicly disparaged this good man's name on a global scale, literally had articles in the UK and in Europe and in Asia on this poor guy. And we were showing how he went above and beyond. It took six months. We got him front page, top fold, New York Times I interview live on ABC, The View. And social media to the rescue, there were people setting up GoFundMe pages and change.org petitions. Bottom line is, he didn't get charged. He got his license back. He was exonerated. And I hope he uh, is successful in the wrongful termination suit he currently has on Harris County Public Health. But of all the things I've done and all of the experiences that I've been privileged to have, that one is a pinnacle of my career. I will not forget the privilege of working to restore that man's good name in that time period. And I will take that to Anybody uh, who tells me that they uh, that they've had the best mm. career, nope, that's mine. I had the best career. That was I, it right there. I love that. How does it even cascade into theft? According to you know, some it's got us that trickle has to start somewhere. To you know, when you tell that story, theft doesn't even enter my mind, right? Because it's someone just going out and trying to help people. How does that cascade? cascade even start into the conversation of theft? 
And maybe you don't really I wish answer I could that. Tell I'm you, just, right? yeah. I, I, I wish I could tell you, other than I think there was an overreaction by the government in thinking how the federal government was going to look at their controlling of the vaccines. Because remember, they sent out vaccines without a lot of process and protocol. This, you know, this doctor said, instead of wasting this vaccine, I'm going to take this file, I'm going to find qualified people, I'm going to fill out the proper paperwork, but I'm going to take it off site. And I'm going to drive to people's homes who couldn't get to me. And I'm going to do yeah. what I what what my Hippocratic oath tells me to do. Uh, and I think what happened was, is it ran afoul with a public policy that was incomplete and erroneous, and people went into CYA mode and uh, mm. overreacted, and and decided that it was better to throw this good man and good doctor under the bus to preserve what they thought was their own um, skin. And obviously, that was wrong on so many levels, morally, procedurally, ethically, and uh, and and we were glad to be able to fix that. But it wasn't without a great deal of unnecessary and undue pain to him and his family. Uh, and uh, like I said, if there's one guy you want to you want to back for, it's a doctor who goes above and beyond like that in the middle of a pandemic. Um, thanks for sharing that. I'm going to go back to that in a second and dig into some of the the nuts and bolts. But first, Bill, I'd love to hear uh, one of your favorite stories. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, for a little while in my career, I said that I peaked early when I had graduated college. Um, really not aimless, but I, you know, I was living in New York and I had, didn't have a true like goal, like, oh, I'll work in PR. It'll be great. Well, I come home one day and my mom plays a message on her answering machine. This is way back, you know, with the tape. And it's a recruiter that asks, hey, have you ever heard of Burton Snowboards? This is the 90s before snowboarding was what it was. We have this opportunity with this PR firm. And my mom just looks at me, you know, she's my family's from the Bronx. They weren't skiers. And they're just like, oh my gosh. So I went in and I secured a job you know, the glamorous role of administrative assistant with a company called Cone and Wolf. And, you know, I did used to joke that I peaked early because the first accounts I was on were Intel, Guinness, the biggest snowboard company in the world, Sony. Now, albeit, I'm at the bottom rung. But a short time later, we're doing what's called a fam trip, which is familiarity trip. And we're taking 20 editors from Manhattan to Vermont to learn to snowboard and see the U.S. Open of snowboarding, which was the biggest snowboard event in the world. So holy cow, I'm a year out of college, maybe, and I'm getting paid to sit on a bus with all these cool editors and then go teach them how to snowboard and watch something that I love go down. And, you know, I'm very fortunate that those early clients, they've since informed what we do here at Remedy. We work in tech. We work in craft beer, even though Guinness is in craft, we work in active outdoor. But you know, those sort of stories, and, and David has a ton, I'm sure, too, like, it's, you get to do a lot of cool things in PR, depending on the brand. And that's something that really makes the job often exciting and worthwhile. And we were talking before we hit record, um, it's, there was a difference between, between being number one versus number two in competition. That's true. Talk about that for a second. Yeah, you know, when it comes to PR, a lot of a lot of the battle is won by being first out of the gate and, and being first to to make to make the news. Now that's not always the case because you know we look at Friendster, MySpace, then Facebook. And a lot of people on the podcast might not remember Friendster. So being the first out does doesn't necessarily matter. But in the in the battle for recognition and PR, it often does. And if you don't mind, I can tell that story I was mentioning about the Consumer Electronics Show, where we can get into that later if you like. No, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, great. So I'm sorry, not the Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, this is a, another anecdote. We had a client that was debuting a technology product for the outdoors about the same time as a much larger global leader. And we kind of knew their product was coming, and we know what their budgets were. And the, the product really was groundbreaking. And then at the end of it, they dropped, hey, by the way, these other guys are coming out with it too. I'm like, ah, fudge, this is not good. <laughs> so I just, I put my hands on the table and I say, hey, we can be the guys that also have what they have at the show, or we can jump out ahead of this. Uh, you know, the best defense is a good offense. Let's get on the road, nominal budget, and just show this product early so that by the time the show comes around, 
we're the guys. We've got the awards, you know, under our belt. At least we're not the guys that also have this. And, you know, Dr. Weiss, it, it, it paid off. They wound up getting six of the awards that were like the majors at the event. Their competitor shared an award with them and their competitor slept on it. Their competitor was the number one brand in the industry. And they kind of rested on that. They thought they could show up and then, hey, we've got mm -hmm. this. And by that time, it was too late. We had, thankfully, our brand like was on board with, hey, let's start running early. Let's start training early. Let's get in front, meet the right people. And it wasn't a glamorous campaign. You know, we met with editors and coffee shops and, you know, hotel lobbies, nothing fancy. Uh, two meetings were in a brewery, which was fun, but it wasn't like, we're not there to get drunk. Like, oh, let's sip a beer and show you this. And that's one of the highlights of my career that we, you know, Davey taking on Goliath just by, by being smart and finding that chink in the armor and thinking that, hey, maybe they're going to rest on being stronger than us. And they are, but we can, we can have to think of. Um, Dave, in a second, I have one follow-up question on that, Bill. Um, and Dave, just something to chew on, because I'm going to ask you this next, but um, where do you start with the crisis? Like when that happened, you mentioned all these media outlets, like everywhere. Where do you even start before you answer that? Um, Bill, I want you to talk about the underdog mentality because it's, it's, I could see it's discouraging, but, uh, you know, like this behemoth, you know, people, let's say someone has a product coming out and, and then you hear Google's coming out, they're like, oh, we're going to be crushed. Right. And so it's a little bit disheartening, but you were able to take that and, and make a positive out of it. What, and you probably have to coach these people up on, on that. So talk about the underdog mentality for a second. Definitely. Uh, it's a lot of, it's about finding angles and finding your niche and, and figuring out what's going to literally what's going to work. So I, I joke around, but I'm definitely serious when I say, I don't want to hire people here that worked with Apple. You'll have relationships, but you've also got Apple budget and our clients, you know, not to nothing against any of them. They're not the, they're not Apple. You know, they're not Samsung where they're having these massive events around the consumer electronics show. We don't, we don't have that to play with. So in PR, nothing, nothing's a given. And, and that's similar to other marketing. You can buy an ad. There's no given that like people are going to buy your product by looking at the ad or click on that banner. With us, you know, with what David and I do, as good as we are at our job, there's still no guarantee that journalist is going to write the story. And when that happens, when you get that best case scenario story in David's world or ours, like we get a feature on a product, you get that dopamine hit. It's, you know, I make sports analogies a lot, which, you know, I shouldn't because I'm not a big ball player, but we scored that basket. When that placement comes out, the Slack message goes to the team and we're throwing high fives virtually because they're just aren't givens no matter how good we are at the job, but you the endorphin rush is real when we land that for our clients. So it, it doesn't matter whether if they're a snowboard company or a new mobile phone or anything like that. It's the rush of, of the job well done is, yeah. is fantastic. And sometimes like David alluded to before, you know, sometimes it's more than others with his last story, like, holy cow, like mind blown, but you know, the rush is always. there. Yeah. Dave, back to you for a second. Um, where do you even start, right? I mean, like you have to be very good at triaging, I guess. Um, for in that case, there's probably a million places to start. So walk me through your mindset when you get that call and what do you do? Yeah, and I use the example of an individual, but most of my, most of my client work is for organizations, nonprofit and for-profit. And the first thing you figure out is what happened. So you get the, you act like a journalist and it's the figuring out what the who, what, where, when are. And if you can, the why and the how. And then from there, you want to talk about what is the organization going to do in response. And what I mean by that is, is there are some times where a, a particular circumstance was perceived as unintended as it might've been, but you know, by an audience as being nefarious or not at meeting expectations or things like that. So you need to message how you are going to remedy that. But before you, before you even message the action, you have to emphasize empathy. 
And when I say empathy, I just want to make sure that I'm clear. I'm not telling organizations that they have to admit culpability when no culpability is there to be made. It may be the fact that they were a victim of something else that was outside of their control. Or maybe, yeah, they had a misstep because um, they didn't take something into account, but it certainly wasn't malicious. Nevertheless, the audience in this day and age, whichever one that is, right, customers, partners, employees, the general public, they are now chattering and chirping on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. You name the social media, LinkedIn, you name the social media platform, and you've got to acknowledge that they are feeling a certain way. So saying, hey, look, I understand how you're feeling. I empathize with how you are reacting to this. I get that. Here's how we're going to make changes. Here's how we're going to rectify this. You diffuse that anger. So that's the first thing we got to do is figure out what to say. And then the second is to who to say it. And what I tell clients every time, I don't care what the size of the organization is. I don't care what the crisis is. I don't care what the industry is. Your first primary audience every time is your employees. First and foremost, that's who you talk to first. It doesn't mean you wait a long time to talk to customers, partners, media, and, and, other, and other audiences. But if you don't address your employees first, who are the front line of communications to all of your other audiences, you are not going to be as successful as you need to be. More importantly, the employees who will feel disenfranchised because you haven't talked to them will undermine anything you say in the public. And most organizations will respond to media first. But half of the stuff that I work on nowadays never sees the light of a news article. The, the PR strategy and the tactics that you employ to counter a crisis are often without putting out a press release because the news organizations are in many circumstances, not the dominant way audiences and employees or otherwise get information. But you've got to address what to say and who to say it and employees always come first. Mm, I love that. You know, a lot of that is kind of counterintuitive because, you know, the reaction would be just to try and fix it or to explain and, and just like start with empathy, start with, you know, hearing where the other side's at. And then second is with the internal team um, and then the, the staff. The, so. the debate that I have oftentimes with executives is taking them out of their comfort zone to show that empathy because they equate it, as I mentioned before, and as admitting culpability. So not in the least, but it also takes them out of their comfort zone because executives, entrepreneurs, successful business people, nonprofit executives have achieved their level in large part, maybe overgeneralizing, but in large part due to two factors. And that's how they have countered adversity. They've either ignored the naysayer, right? They tuned it out or they fought through obstacles, barreled through different things that people said you can't do it. And they'll default to those when there's an adverse crisis communication matter. But in that, what I call the fight or flight mode, they either tune people out, they don't respond, there's no comment. It only emphasizes the other narrative and draws credence to the perception that the organization is incompetent, insecure, or unfeeling. Or if they counter with rebuttal and angry retort and, you know, sort of these caustic messaging, it only exacerbates the anxiety and the animosity that the audience feels. You haven't diffused the situation. You've only put gasoline on the fire. And so I take, I take those executives out of the comfort zone when we put up messaging that expresses empathy and action. Yeah. I love it. I remember I had um, one of my favorite books is never split the difference by Chris Voss. And when he talks, he says like, in a negotiation, uh, it's about empathy. I mean, it's about yeah. hearing where the other side's at. And even when, you know, he was with the FBI and they were dealing with terrorists, you know, same thing. Uh, so, uh, Bill, for you, I wanted to hear, you know, we talked a little bit in the beginning about PR in general, and I know there's been a lot of changes over the years. So could you talk a little bit about how PR has, has changed? Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's an education aspect that often goes overlooked. And to flip it back to advertising, which I mentioned before, we know that work worked in advertising previously is going to deliver different results now. Your Super Bowl ad is going to have a different viewership than it did five years ago or 10 years ago. And it's going to cost different. The billboard that you drive by on the highway, which still matters, that's going to have a different level of impact than it did before. And some of that is the creative. In public relations, we've done a bad job, personally, I feel like, of educating the client on how things have changed. And by, 
by that, I mean, you know, like as David's seen before, there's everything from the Instagram influencer, which I don't consider them influencers. They're just little local media outlets. Some have a bigger following than others. Some have the following of that newspaper that gets thrown in your driveway every week. And others, you know, have the following of USA Today to print magazines and, you know, mainstream websites. And it, there used to be technology has democratized PR to such an extent that anyone can do it if you've got the phone and you've got an internet connection, but that also makes it harder. There's now more brands than ever, more independent shops, more one or two person organizations that are going after it and also flooding the inboxes of the gatekeepers that control USA Today or your favorite Instagram person or that blogger. We don't even call them bloggers anymore, but whatever, the YouTuber. So whenever we, you know, one of our big flags, whenever we get a new potential client is they tell us 10 years ago, they did X, Y, and Z and it was great. I'm like, okay, that's, that's cool. You know, but that's, you know, that may not work today. And if you look at sports, you know, the plays that worked on the field in football, they've had, had to change. And that's the other part with education is you know, we look at the highlight reels on Sports Center, the left-handed Hail Mary with four seconds left in the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl. That's the highlight reel. But, you know, usually you're getting those like that yardage just by running the ball or the short passes that aren't sexy. They're not cool, but it, it, it matters. The left-handed Hail Mary is not a strategy. That's just something that's it's nice to show. So yeah. on our end, it's trying to explain to clients it's going to take more effort and it's also going to be split up. Like way back when I started my career, there were 12 men's magazines. There was no internet. Okay, cool. We're just going after those 12 magazines for men. Now, everything. You've got your podcast. You've got everything else in the world. So what are some non-sexy things, Bill, that work now? So you mentioned like, would an example be contacting some micro influencers on Instagram? Like what would be an example of something? Massive. Yeah. You, you just nailed it. That, that's one of them. And, you know, clients, sometimes they want to put together fancy lookbooks and things like that, but it, it's moving the needle by having multiple touch points. So if you go to this, whatever website, your favorite one is, let's say you go to men's journal and you see a product there. Cool. And then you forget about it. And Men's Journal is only going to feature your new, your new coffee mug so many times. So how else do we get out in front of you? Well, then we hit those five micro-influencers that you follow. And maybe it's on, if it's a local product, on your local morning show or in your local newspaper. Uh, again, that's not as sexy as that, like, you know, cover story in that big magazine that you want to hit. But, you know, we've had clients that have gotten the most results out of being placed in a trade magazine with 20,000 followers, that's the right people, not the most, but the right. And like, I, I joke still, like we'll, we'll land a client, we'll land a snowboard company in the wall street journal. Awesome. And my dad calls me awesome. He's not buying a snowboard, right? You know, millions of people are seeing this, you know, how many of them actually snowboard and I'm not discounting landing that product there. Cause that's, a lot of good impressions, but then we need to be everywhere else, as impressive as it is to be in the Wall Street Journal. Because believe me, that's what I'm posting on LinkedIn. Because everyone's heard of it. Hey, look what we did. But the reality is that block and tackle, just grinding away, getting the yards on the field, moving the ball is what's going to benefit the client most. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. It's big social proof, but there's other things that will it will kind of boost up the other channels because it was in that that large publication. And Dave, I wanted to ask um, for you, you mentioned obviously in, and Bill, you said this too, which everything's on your phone now. And um, I'd love for you to talk about the reality of cancel culture, Dave. Yeah. The, the cancel culture is a legitimate phenomenon and whether you like it or not, it's here to stay. And here's what I mean by that. You can't be in a position now where you say something that is Maybe your opinion, and maybe it's a legitimate opinion, even if it's not widely shared. You have to expect that you are going to get detractors who are going to respond accordingly in social media. I, I wish I could tell you that we were in a, in a day and age where we could have civil discourse, where we could share ideas. And you know what? 
doesn't happen nowadays. So what you have to do, like it or not, especially if you are an executive or an organization that has a wide range of audiences that you cater to, customers and so forth, you have got to be able to either do one or two things. One is be consistent and take a stand and respectful, even when others are distract, you know, d- detracting to you. Or you need to rethink your messaging. I'll tell you an organization that does it, I think, really, really well, right? Patagonia. Patagonia is sort of my go-to example of an organization that is unapologetic in its commitment to environmental sustainability and offering products and a business and operational model that says so, and is also trying to be the example by which others emulate. They are going to have detractors who say, what does it matter? Why does it care? Why do I, I'm not going to do that there because your price point is X amount more than what I can get at Walmart or Target. Fair enough. But they know that that's their specialty and they are going to, they are going to stay that way. Where I saw a lot of organizations fail, right, is when the George Floyd murder case with the Derek Chauvin, when that went down and Derek Chauvin was found guilty of the murder of George Floyd, you know, the, um, the African-American who was murdered in Minneapolis because Derek Chauvin had his knee on his neck for a little, for approximately eight minutes. Um, there were organizations that tried to express their support for diversity and inclusion. And there were a handful that got flame sprayed for that. And everybody's like, why? Well, because You happen to be an organization that gave lip service. You have an all-white executive team with an all-white board, no women, no people of color. You're a a product, and so you're just giving lip service, and people were going to take exceptions to that. Well, guess what? That's probably an acceptable response for people who are going to call you out for that. Some people call it cancel culture. Maybe people just call it the, the focus group of 2021 that doesn't have to be done in a closed room, conference room setting with a whole bunch of people, right? You're going to get instant feedback from that. How you respond to the cancel culture with empathy and action will make or break whether an organization has a chance to continue normal operations or run a real risk of not being in existence anymore, depending on your size and scale. I've got plenty of examples from that. <laughs> Excuse me, but that's where crisis PR has been more in demand nowadays because any organization of any size, I said, can be go from here to zero in an Instagram post. And many people, many organizations will find themselves in a misstep because they didn't take that into account. Um, I wish I could tell you that, you know, we lived in a day and age where you didn't necessarily have that instant feedback and maybe some will take it out of context. It is what it is. I don't see it going away anytime soon. Dave, I want to hear um, what's another example like Patagonia of a company that's unapologetic. And by the way, I don't, I don't know if you have a book, but I have the title for your new book which is unapologetic. I don't, maybe there is a book out there that's, that's, uh, that's called there, but with the subtitle is you have to obviously express empathy. So it kind of goes against the apology, but anyways, um, because I love that as a, as a concept, what's another example like Patagonia that's just unapologetic about its values and expresses yeah, that. Um, you know, you know what I would, I would say the first one that comes to mind for me is Harley Davidson. Now you can, you know, Harley Davidson has a brand and, and, an, and an unreserved promise about being a symbol of freedom, right? America, you know, middle Midwestern, you know, sort of, you know, kind of, you know, run in the road, the Jack Kerouac on the road again. And it's for a certain demographic, as much as they're trying to expand on diversity, that is a demographic that subscribes to Harley and they are, and they're milking that for all it's worth. And you know what? It works for them. Do they do it in a way that disparages other, you know, other groups and other audiences that they don't cater? No. But they're unapologetic as to what they are, and maybe that's the maybe that's the point for all this, right? Is is in cases where I get called in, I think some people will, in some organizations and executives will say, "Look, I want you to to make this all go away." Like I'm I'm tired of seeing anybody who's talking ill about my company. Like I got news for you, you're not pleasing everybody. That's not necessarily a good measure of success in crisis PR. The the measure of effect is. Do you have your audience group, right? The, the people that you cater to and the people you should cater to either in support of you or giving you the benefit of the doubt. Because oftentimes we, you see the naysayers and the detractors are people that Bill talked about, right? They are people who don't, aren't necessarily buying from you in the first place. So why are you worried about them? Why are you concerned about whether or not they are going to voice an objection to you? 
Because if they don't, if they don't like you, chances are the people that they are communicating with and telling that we're buying from you anyway. So, you know, don't worry about that. And it is some respects growing a thicker skin. Now, if you've got an overwhelming majority or your core audience is starting to question whether they should continue to buy from you and have a relationship, different story, right? But you got to start looking at it for those lens. And it's difficult, right? Because anybody who's talking ill of you, most good organizations and tried and true executives take that personally, right? It's a reflection of their identity. And I get that. Got to grow thicker skin. Love it. Um, I want to hear from each of you a challenge or, you know, lesson learned, like a maybe you know, we can call it a failure or whatever you want to call it, but a challenge or where you consider maybe a failure that you learned a big lesson in your career that you obviously took throughout and, and did things differently. Um, so Bill, I'd like to start with you and just what's a, either a challenge, failure point that you learned a big lesson? Yeah. I, one of our biggest shortcomings and me personally is a lack of networking. Like I, I wish that you could just get partners and earn money just by being good at your job. And that's just not truly the case. And this has come up a couple of times. I finally learned my lesson. I'm branching out more, but what happens often when, when we lose clients is they're acquired by someone larger. Uh, so we're working with, say, this smaller, this is a true story, a smaller mobile phone company, and they're acquired by T-Mobile. Now, T-Mobile has their giant New York City PR firm back from my old hood, and the smaller mobile phone company in our budget, that's a blip, right? So what's going to happen? They get acquired. We see it coming. Hey, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Yeah, six months later, we're not fine, right? It's... Of course, we're not going to get the T-Mobile business, my team of nine. You know, it's going to go to the, you know, all the business is going to go to the New York City firm. And that's happened again with like device companies we've worked with and things like that. And, and it's not that the brand that we're speaking with doesn't think we'll be fine. Well, they might be a little bit naive to it. In, in reality, is, is nobody knows. And one of the things that, you know, not in crisis PR, but yeah, we do need to prepare more for that on my side, where we've got to be a little bit more aggressive with our networking and aggressive with the new business and just preparing for those sorts of things. But then it also gets difficult to our earlier conversation is we don't want to grab partners that we're not going to come through at. You know, if, if I tell you I'm a great athlete and you invite me to play golf and I'm really only a good volleyball player, you know, there's better people you might want to bring. So we just got to, on our end, that's been my biggest lesson is just you know, networking more because sometimes the it's going to pay off in the end if you do, and you've definitely got to prepare for those times when things change because things will change. Thanks for that, Bill. Dave, what about you? Lessons, yeah. challenges, failures. Same thing. Same things to uh, to Bill's point is you better be prepared to fail, and and seeing the failure early is paramount. So. I, I had mentioned, you know, sort of in passing that, you know, I decided to pivot to crisis PR, which I had a skill set on there. And I mentioned stop competing with great guys, you know, like Bill and company directly for that promotional side. I, I, I glossed over a real painful period when there was a whole lot of competing promotional PR firms. And it was just an absolute grind just to try to make payroll to the point that I said, look, I can continue to bang my head against the wall and try to compete in an oversaturated market, or I'm going to go someplace else, right? The bills of the world were making a lot of good money. And then there's a bunch of us that were making, you know, eh, we're maybe keeping the lights on or most of the lights on. And it, it, it just became a real tough slog. And I realized it's because I had a service model that was probably good about seven years ago, and then was basically passe by the time I, I woke up to it. So it's like any other business. You got to wake up to the fact that you're, the chances are to fail. And if you can find those failure points early, you can see those, you can make adjustments quick enough. And that's just the secret to, I think, business and entrepreneurship. And, and, and to that end, I'll, I'll add one more thing. You better enjoy the grind. You know, if you don't get up and enjoy doing this and enjoy the elements, even the ones that suck, um, you probably want to do something else because I, I can't imagine doing anything else right now. I absolutely love what I do. And I, I spend an enormous amount of hours doing it, but it's not work. It's just a ton of fun. I get to meet really cool people. 
I get to hear their problems. I get to be a resource at a time when they really need it. And I get to fix stuff and move on to something else. Um, I, 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 if I can't do this, people are like, what else would you do? I, I don't really know. <laughs> I just don't know. And um, maybe I, you know, if I do this right, maybe I, hopefully I'll never know. Last question for each of you. And before I ask it, uh, I just want to point people towards where they should go to learn more about you and your company. Dave, where should people go to check out more? Publicrelationssecurity.com. Publicrelationssecurity.com is the website. I'm also Dave Oates on LinkedIn uh, and Facebook, but LinkedIn is the one that I've got a whole bunch of other uh, stuff and content that I do, weekly blogs and and the like. And uh, I, I hope people just, you know, even if they just link in and they ask me a basic question, I, I, like I said, I love what I do, even if it's just a bouncing idea off of, um, I'm, I'm always happy to do so. Awesome. Bill, what about you? Where should people go to check out more? It's remedypr.com. Uh, PR just tacked to the wine remedy. And I do a lot of what I'll call educational posting on LinkedIn. I do treat LinkedIn more as a service where I try to give. So I encourage anyone that's at all got a question about product and consumer PR to, to drop me a line. I always say, you know, if we can't help you, we'll try to send you to someone in our network that can. Uh, because also there is, you know, David mentioned earlier, like the churn and burn PR, there's some apps and things that are trying to sell people on this just constant PR is easy and you can do it. You can pay this, but th their model is to go through clients every three months, which is not how, you know, any good PR person wants to activate. So I encourage anyone that's got an interest or a concern or thinking about jumping in, like I'll never sell you on us. Maybe I should but I'll definitely tell you what not to buy. Awesome. Last question for each of you. You know, I always like hearing this audience likes hearing it, different resources. It could be a book. It could be a tool. It could be an app that you use. It could be a couple. So um, Dave, I'll start with you. What are some resources people should check out? It could be a book, app, tool, whatever, whatever strikes your fancy. I, I, I'm still a big fan of Jim Collis. It's good to great. And, 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 uh, uh, the successor on that one, which is uh, uh, the failure book, the big enough to fail, where he talks about the ones who who were great, and sustainable, and then the ones who failed. And if I remember correctly, there's a couple of companies that's in one of the other. Circuit City is the one that I think come to mind that was in both books, though, because of at the time they were lauded, and then they failed. And why did they fail? I think those are really good hard lessons learned, not only for our little world of PR, but I just think for for organizations, individuals, entrepreneurs in general. Awesome. And Bill, what about you? What are some favorite tools, resources, books? You know, what one that I've used recently, and this is sounding so mundane, but it's the do not disturb button on Apple products. Hmm. Uh, sometimes we just get so, especially, I'm sure you do, Dr. Weiss as well, but like David and I with colleagues and friends and just an overwhelming amount of dings and dangs. Uh, recently, I celebrated a birthday, which you know, this is what I'll call a true middle-class problem. I knew the texts and calls and all the messages were going to be coming through. So I hit the do not disturb button. And then I did the allow for my wife and my parents. And that was, that really helped me not, we stress out that we need to respond when in reality we don't. But something else though, for, for any business owner, especially a, a starting entrepreneur, a book that I like to give them is by a journalist called Mark Manson. And it's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fudge. Mm. And what I love about that, it, it, it's less about marketing and more about being able to just take time and take a step back. Because it, as David sees for sure in crisis PR, but we see with our partners and me personally, it's really easy to, to lose that self-control and kind of get lost, like, oh my gosh, someone said something to me or someone sent this email to me. It's like, hold on, like, take a breath, you know, which sounds so like common to say now, but it's something we all, I think we need to do more of. And like, let's sit back. All right, take 30 seconds. The world's not actually ending. What can we do? So that's a book I give to actually a lot of friends. I'll buy like five off Amazon at a time and mail them out. I love it. First of all, I love that because some of the people I just highly respect and it's about boundaries. 
And they use, it annoys me because I'll call them at a certain hour and it'll go right to voicemail. But I totally get it because they have created these boundaries around their life that, listen, this is certain periods of time. You cannot contact me. And so I, I really respect that. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. And just want to thank both of you. Um, thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you on the other side. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Great time. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.